Good morning, everyone. I'm Chad Coolis, Executive Director of the Midway Chamber of Commerce, and thank you for joining us for our Leadership Summit. This is the sixth time we've had a Leadership Summit. We do this in partnership with Augsburg University. And uh, this year, it's a little different. Last year, we ended up not doing one. This year, instead of having a few breakout sessions in the morning, we are just doing the one here at 11 o'clock, and then we have our lunch presentation at noon, and I hope you can stick around for that as well. And as I mentioned, we do this in partnership with Augsburg University. Our sponsor today is American National Bank. You're going to hear from Kathy Berkey at noon. And uh, we appreciate our partnership with Augsburg, and they've always been really instrumental in helping set the agenda for today. I hope you're going to have a lot of things that you can take away from this. This is being recorded. I'll also mention that if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll get to as many of them as we can. At this point, I would like to welcome our partner in this from Augsburg University. Please welcome Alan Tuchtenhagen. And you're on mute. Great way to start this morning, right? All right, um, I'm on mute, thanks. Um, can you hear and see me okay? Is it coming clear? All right. So anyway, welcome everybody and, and thank you, Chad, and thank you, American National Bank, for being one of the sponsors of this. Glad to see you here and 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 participating this year in the summit. As Chad mentioned, we did not do one last year. We've been doing these for quite a while. And the pandemic has kind of thrown a variety of things in our way as we've sort of moved through this, but if nothing else, this pandemic among a number of other things in 2020 and 2021, have presented us with some significant leadership challenges. And probably no better time um, in the last 20, 30, 40 years to be studying leadership and learning more about leadership and doing, expanding our own professional development about leadership than maybe right now. So um, thanks, and I'm glad you're here uh, that, and Augsburg is proud to be a partner in this and you're gonna be hearing a little bit more from President Priven now in just a little bit. Uh, right now, I want to introduce Carol Burton and um, say a few things about Carol. You may have read about her just a little bit, but I think you're going to find this an interesting program. Carol is a, is a go-to resource in tough conversations on professional development. She focuses on equity, ethics, and adaptability that help organizations retain their leaders. She blends worldly views, leadership, and business insight. Carol is the founder of facilita and facilitator of Re Radiance Resources, and the podcast host for Radiance Real Talk. Carol guides mid-level managers in how to adapt and expand their team's development. As Carol walks beside leaders, she delivers valuable content to their team, encouraging emerging leaders to find their voices and navigate the workplace successfully. These efforts create a meaningful atmosphere where employees feel heard and valued, hence a new way of knowing emerging leaders. Carol's professional expertise includes sales and purchasing in multiple retail and industrial manufacturing organizations. She holds a bachelor's degree in human resources and a master's degree in leadership from Augsburg University, which emphasizes organizational framing perspectives, uh, creative problem solving and issues resolution. So if you would join me in welcoming Carol Burton. Carol, it's all yours. Hello, welcome. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Chad. Thank you to our sponsors, so appreciate you. Thank you all for the silent claps. I saw you clapping, yay. So I hope that you are enjoying this amazing day. Every day we get to be leaders and lead and guide and follow and work with each other. It is an amazing day. So I wanted to let you know that I see life in a very different way. I ask you to look at these, what I'm going to present from a different lens, simply planting a seed to see how it will grow and how we can help and support each other be our best. So with that said, let's see if we can fire up our, my presentation and go from there. Can you all see my presentation at this point? Yes, perfect, wonderful. So uh, Alan, uh, Dr. Alan, he asked me to uh, have a conversation to put this together. I thought, now this is interesting. We can look at equity from a whole different perspective as far as how we see blind spots that we all know we have and how does perfectionism play into that? So 
one thing that I learned being a graduate of Augsburg University was really about query, was really about discernment. And I use those as, uh, as, a, as a curious thinker to say, what are the whys? We always live in the hows in the workplace. I assert to ask us, let's look at the whys. And ROTI in this space that I've developed is return on total investment. It is the 360 mindset of how we can combine human skills, human development of our leaders and, our, and of, of all levels within our organizations with the financial thriving turn. The one thing that I have found in life is that the only thing that is constant in life is change. And so that is where I play. Let me see if I can do this so that I can advance. Are you going to advance for me? There we are. So really it's about how do we thrive to survive? What does that really look like? I think COVID has opened us up to look at this from a personal perspective, from our families, from our organizations, literally where we gather. We're learning different ways of adapting, and that's what we're going to focus in today. Thank you, Alan, for the great introduction. Um, seeing that uh, Alan has already described a lot of what you see on this page, I thought to put in some fun facts. One is I have had the opportunity both in my undergraduate and in my graduate uh, commencement speeches to be the speaker. Um, I was asked and nominated in both. Another fun fact, just to give you a little bit more rounding, is that I had the opportunity in 2015 to go ring the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. And I will tell you that both speaking and that uh, experience, both of those experiences, I was just doing me. I was just doing my job. So the one thing that I have found is that I really understand storytelling, which I think is so important right now. And that is part of my story, if you will, uh, as far as how I've developed Radiance Resources. So I'll explain that along the way. So I wanted to start off with what is unconscious bias. I, I think we all know and have an idea of what unconscious bias is, but we found a really great article about what it means specifically in the workplace, right? So their underlying attitudes and stereotypes that people unconsciously attribute to another person or a group and how they, how they engage and how they understand. It is really is from a scientific perspective, from a psychological perspective, it's how we simply, it's how we easily simplify the world. That's all unconscious bias is. That's all implicit bias is. And so with that said, I thought, now that's really interesting because I didn't realize that there's a beauty bias. So I thought to share, like, what are some of the implicit biases that we don't even realize surround us that we're impacted by? You know, we know the classics, right? Ageism, gender, height. I've seen that in interview process where someone was too tall, believe it or not, or someone was too short as a way to eliminate these people, kind of like what the ATS system does today. I thought it was interesting about name bias as well, but it was really interesting about Sibide. And if you look at it to a degree with all of these, she's impacted by all these biases. However, she chose to look at beauty bias as where she says impacts her work in Hollywood. So then I thought, well, let me go a little further. Let's go a little deeper. And in the workplace, the common biases that are out there is authority bias. The supervisor says, A, everybody follows. So authority is also, well, because they've got that experience, we're going to follow what that person said. Conformity is everybody conforms, even though they may not all agree. There is no true consensus so that all voices are heard. Anchor bias is essentially a way that we uh, essentially put a benchmark and then everything has to hit those notes. Just a few to consider. Again, this is all about consideration. My assertion is, is that we don't have to align with our declared beliefs because we can actually shift. Even though this work comes, our biases are formed at a very young age, believe it or not. It may not even follow our actions. 
And I think what happens is that, especially with what COVID has opened up, is that we've become aware in a way that we hadn't thought before. And also we can really look at things from an objective because once we have that aha moment, that trigger in our head to say, wait a minute, let me look at this again. Then we're open to grow. Theoretically, we're open to go out and learn. And then we can say, well, now that's interesting. Let me look at this a little bit more. Let me see what's possible or not. I thought this was interesting. So just to let you know, I really focus on communication equity and employee equity. Fun fact, there's about 10 to 15 different types of equity. Did you know that? It's fabulous. Citigroup City did a, a very interesting report. First of all, I was surprised they did the report. So we're just gonna look at racial equity just for a moment. I thought it was interesting that in their report, which is available online, I also have it if you all need to look at it, it's fantastic. But their quote was, if racial groups for blacks had been closed 20 years ago, the US GDP would have benefited $16 trillion. I simply found that an interesting statement. And they're saying if we close the gaps right now, we could for the next five years could be an additional $5 trillion to the GDP. $5 trillion. And I'm sitting here going from an employee mindset, we work our tails off. Some of us, let's get, we are working 60, 70, sometimes 80 hours an hour, 80 hours a week. And I'm thinking, what if we did the same conversation, the same type of report for how we communicate, how we move our processes, how we move our systems and structures, how we create great relationship with our employees, both current, future, and past, with our vendors, with our clients, what would that look like from a 360 perspective as we thrive to survive in this different way? If we really look at our biases, really look at our biases as an organization, in other words, how do we fuse bias into our company culture every single day? What would that really, really look like? It's just something simply to consider. So I wanna stop for a moment, if you all don't mind. And if there's any questions or if anyone wants to chime in and ask a question, especially on this, because this is real, for a private firm to do this type of conversation of report, this has got some meat to this bones. Or if you have questions on implicit bias in general, What does this resonate for you? And I'll just say, if anybody wants to either put it in chat or if you feel comfortable, you can unmute yourself or ask, to, I think you have to ask to be unmuted, but I'd be willing to do that if anybody wants to just ask Carol the question directly that they might have. One thing I would like to see covered, if you if you have it, Carol, is uh, how do we get there? How do we close the the gap? It's a it's 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 a process, and I will be going through it because these gaps about different types of equity, the different callocations of equity, for me, all stem in communication and implicit bias. That's where they all stem. So it's a mindset shift, is what my argument is. And we do have a question from Dennis Wolf. What would an example of communication equity look like in a typical workplace? Sure. So a perfect example is I uh, am working with a client currently that is going through a major issues uh, conflict, a major conflict right now. And what's happened is that one, they weren't listening to each other literally. And two, because of how they were working and living through their emotions, because a younger employee 
would be communicating with the executive director. The executive director would take four to five to six days to return the answer. The young employee may not have realized what's on the plate and may not have understood the gravity of how much is on the executive director's plate. So what happened was that, that she wasn't valued, that her voice wasn't being heard. When she attempted to go to other people, everybody else was very busy as well. So therefore she became isolated in her mind, not realizing, and, and then what, what was really going on. And the other piece was, then the young employee was sending six, seven, eight, ten 10 emails. So therefore the executive director started getting annoyed. And so this was all through email. So at one point, the young employee decided to create a meeting because of the frustration level was getting so high. Well, the executive director said that she would come and she didn't. So therefore on Monday, we went through a two and a half hour conversation to really work through what was missing in the conversation. And bottom line, it was both parties weren't listening to each other. They didn't know how to talk to each other. They never had taken the time to figure out how each other works. There was never necessarily a, I had this happen again with another, uh, another client where in that case, they didn't even sit down to do an orientation with that young person. So therefore that young person was so confused and was missing deadlines that everyone was getting upset at him and he didn't know why. So it's a lot of times it's breakdowns in what is assumed, what is thought, to, you, you know what I mean? It's like what is assumed may not be the same because the executive director had a different communication orientation than that young person did. And the other thing in this case, uh, one of the other case, a third case that I've had is that then you have a cultural difference because there was another mid-level manager who was having, having issues with a younger employee. The younger employee is half Palestinian. So you've got that going on. Right, you know, as far as not even realizing the culture. So when I talk about culture, I'm not talking about race and nationality. I'm talking about orientation of where that person comes from, of what their learnings are, based upon their experience and knowledge or lack thereof. So those are the different nuances of communication equity that come in play. <clears throat> Thank you, Carol. That was a, that was a good question, Dennis. And Don Zuge has a question. She says, I was fascinated by your previous slide that said implicit bias doesn't have to follow our declared beliefs and yeah. may not follow our actions. Yeah. Can you say more about this or give some examples? Sure. So in this case, what I believed when, okay, so full disclosure, I'm 54. Turn 54 on Monday, don't have a problem saying that. So what I believed 10 years ago with how my let's I'll just go personal uh, 10 years ago with my mom and my dad how I talked to them was very different six years later I was when I was 20 I still looked at them as my parents as the authoritarian 10 years ago we move through major conversation that I'm, I am still an adult child from my dad. My mother's now gone. And yet I still respect my father in a very, 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 very reverent way. And I have developed an amazing relationship with him so that we can openly talk. We can really have deep, real conversations. That takes a lot of work. So even though he's my father, he will always be my father. I realized that what I believed as a child is no longer so today. So I can't necessarily live in my past if I don't understand how the current situation has shifted and changed. So therefore, my actions now are not of as a child, working with my father, speaking to my father, adhering to my father's wishes. As an adult now, I declare my beliefs to say, Dad, I respect you. I do not agree. 10 years ago, I could not say that. Now I can. 
So it's a different way of shifting. I know that my father has final say on his life. Absolutely. No doubt about it. And he now works with me in a different way. So therefore his shifts, his declared beliefs have changed about me and his relationship with me in turn. And so they, the, the, what I did believe no longer exists because I've made work to change those biases of my father. He's the end all and be all. Everything that rises and sets with my father. Everything, see, I had to change that action to, I walk with my dad. We made hard decisions with my mom as she was moving through 12 years of dementia. And I still needed to respect both of them for their make for how they ran their life, their family, and their marriage. Those are huge shifts from what I was, you know, what I mean, when I was as a child to where I, where I am today. <clears throat> Thank you, Carol. We don't have any other questions right now. Okay. Um, so now might be a good time to, to move on to your next yep. portion. Not a problem. Perfect timing. Thank you for the fantastic questions. I, uh, I am a vulnerable leader as well, so I do share my life. I wanted to share with you a real quick video that I was inspired to create um, earlier this year. Um, and it's it was a different way of looking at understanding equity. So hopefully this will work. If not, I have a backup. A couple weeks ago, I was in an interview and I started telling the story about the apple and the apple tree orchard. Basically, if I have an apple in my hand, think about your favorite one or your favorite fruit or whatever. And I only concentrate on that apple in this case. I get afraid that I'm gonna lose that apple. Some people would call that the scarcity mindset. Because if I lose that apple, I've lost control. My question is, is that really true? Is that a truth or the truth? I ask, drop the apple, let the apple go. And walk into a different mindset of abundance. So when I let the apple go, I start to recognize an entire apple tree orchard around me, filled with all kinds of amazing apples, and that's abundance. I realized that people want to support me. People want to help. As I was concentrating on one apple, it gets kind of hard. So I ask you to look at yourself. Are you focused on the apple or the apple tree orchard? If you're, at, if you're looking at that apple orchard, that's where equity is. That's where abundance lies. You need more, not less. Something to consider, thought to share. I hope that helps you on your day. Take care. So I thought to share that with you all because it was just a great way to walk us through a different mindset of what equity really is. So, when I was a child, I'd say, mom, da, 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 go look it up. So the Britannica encyclopedia became my best friend because she would never answer my questions. And so I went to dictionary.com to look up what is equity. Equity is fairness and impartiality, the quality of being fair and impartial. So I thought to ask the question of, when inequity is in the workplace, how is that impacted? Now, remember, we also talked about implicit bias. So we got that going on too, right? So when inequity is in place, whom and how do you hire? Do you hire people that are, that are, that are thinkers like you? There's a bias. You know, how, how do we retain and promote employees? Again, from that thinking of equity of being fair and impartial, not giving things up, but gaining more. What are your vendor relationships look like? How, and I'm not talking about diversity as far as just culture and color, please know. 
there is all different types of divergent thinkers. Do you have vendors who are veterans, as an example? Do you have women vendors? Do you have vendors who have a whole different divergent way of doing business? That's of course above board. You know, what is your relationship with your customers or your clients? How are you looking at your financial expansion? Are you still going back to the same customer base that you've gone to for years? We're making bigger pies. That's what equity does. It, make, it expands the pie. And do in your organization with your clients, your employees, and your vendors, do you really have divergent thinkers? Again, folks from different experiences, right? Having different experiences and different knowledge. That's all equity is. So I thought to dissect that down a little bit, just to ask that question. If we wanted to do a breakout, we can, after I show this next slide, because I think that would be a great break for us for right now, because I know this stuff is heavy and it's where I play. So I have fun with it, to be honest. <laughs> a couple of months back, to be bluntly honest with you, last summer, I started to ask, well, actually in 2019, I started to ask myself a question, what would equity look like in the workplace every day? How would our systems be different? What would that look like? But I realized that I needed to understand for myself what equity is for the workplace. And this is what I came up with. For me, equity in the workplace is a balance of ensuring that there's a level playing field for everyone to be, to feel, not be, but feel seen, heard, and valued. It's stepping out of being me-centered and shifting into being we-centered. When we focus on the we, that's a bigger conversation. We contribute to a mission larger than ourselves. Through being part of a we culture, each of us has the opportunity to, to provide real world solutions, drive that profit, increase the bottom line, and prioritize our people equally. It's a different perspective. So then I kept hearing this language, DEI in the workplace, DEI in the workplace. No stopping on that, par on that paraphrase, DEI in the workplace. Hmm. So I started listening from that perspective of our business world and where our segments are, where we gather, both profit, nonprofit, civic, and, and public, didn't matter. I said, ah. In the workplace, diversity is the recruiting, selection, interview, hiring, and onboarding process. It's getting people in. Inclusion is keeping them there, right? So that's retention, that's professional development, leadership development, and career growth strategy. And for me, the engine that connects the two is that, that daily equity practice that I talk about as far as the systems and the processes for sustainability. For me, in this case, equity actually connects the diversity and inclusion in the workplace. And that's it. So it's very different. You see then the what definite, if we look up dictionary.com, right, of what diversity, equity, and inclusion are. I wanted to bring this as a bonus, again, from a different mindset. If it's okay with you, can we do a breakout, Chad, so that you all can talk about what this is and where we are as far as the bias, as far as equity, and as far as how we look at in the workplace, DE&I, but more so how we really focus on equity. That's the question. How do we focus on equity? How does equity, how is equity in your workplace looking at it from a bigger, broader brush you know, it could be intergenerational equity. In other words, all the different age groups that are in organizations today. It could be how, you know, your, how diverse in thought, experience and knowledge is your supply base, your vendors. What are you doing to help mold and shape your vendors so that, that they can be successful and so can you in your cost savings, cost avoidance and cost reductions because that's where the game is when it comes to that space. We all know this. So I always look at the money as well as the human skill space, always. They, they are, to me, they're, that's the 360 of the ROTI. 
And we can do this just for a couple of moments. However, you want to push that out, Chad. Why don't we assign people in breakout rooms and they can have a small group time and okay. we do that for is five minutes good, Carol? Yeah, that should be great. Just right. a couple of minutes, just say who you are, say hello, because I want you all to interact with each other, right, as members, that's so important, um, just to hear, again, different think, think, different thought processes to this perspective. Okay, and the rooms are going to be open now.
Give everyone another few seconds to get back in the room. All right, Carol, I lost you for a second. I see you now. <laughs> When I get back, yeah. you're in a different box now for me, but um, <laughs> Carol, I think all the rooms are back now. So if you want to yep. continue. Yep, we'll continue. So thank you all for that. I hope that that was meaningful. I hope you all got the opportunity to play with some different voices and different conversations. Thank you for your vulnerability because that is the key to this as well, just so you all know. Um, and so I want to continue on and let's see if this will work again. Yay. So I, I look at, um, I look at the whys and the hows of life. So I really look at not so much, well, Carol, how do you do it? How do you fix it? We've lived in that space of do, do human doing. I ask for us to look at human being. Who are we being? So if I'm looking at who I am being in this space, I'm looking to see from an adaptive mindset, the why. So with the why, I'm never looking at the how. I'm really not. I'm looking at the why. Because if I understand my why, the how naturally shows up. We have to remember, everyone, we are in a whole new playing field, no pun intended. We are creating a whole new playing field because no one has ever experienced COVID. They were babies. Our, you know, our centurions, they were babies. So because we are in a whole new game, everybody is, I don't care what anybody says, this is my opinion, this is Carol Burton's opinion, everybody is on the same level. I don't care how much money you have, I don't care what your title is, it doesn't matter. Everyone is on the same playing field right now. My question is, how are we going to be in our why to communicate effectively and be open to active hope? That's my question. So why do we need to have an adaptive mindset? My argument is we increase engagement and retention, point blank. We simply, we, we simplify and have daily work processes to increase ROI. Return on investment doesn't have to be the financials. We live in a divergent thinking. I always worked as a leader when I was working in corporate America to have divergent thinkers, regardless if they were colleagues, if they were uh, the building operation folks, because they everyone has a, play, has a part to play. 
And so I've chosen to live my life in an abundance mindset. And that is hard because the scarcity mindset demon is always on my back. So for me, I look at the return on total investment of human skills and the financial expansion. You've got to have both because both play into each other. They really do. They both play into each other. And so that is where I look at the why, honestly, more so than the how. Does anyone have any questions on this? Again, it's a mind bender. <laughs> I live in a different perspective of life. I haven't seen any questions on the chat. Right. We'll move on. <clears throat> we, we can move on unless anybody wants to either. Okay, sounds good. Carol, can you say okay, more about, we'll the simple, Thank you. about the simple daily work processes? Yeah, that is where we create equity in the workplace every day with the systems and processes. So we physically, so what I do is that I actually look at how people are communicating, how, what language are they using in their communication style when they're, when they're connecting with someone, regardless of device, because, because of the fact that we are in box land as some people call zoom and the other uh, software applications out there right now we can't rely upon necessarily the energy although i work really hard to create an energy space in the containers when i am uh, virtual and that's a skill set unto itself which is an amazing process for me um it, it's really in our in our daily workplace what systems are so incredibly cumbersome that absolutely make no sense that causes consternation with the team? I think that simplicity is the key to life right now. And common sense is part of that. Do we need to go through 12 steps to get a, a, an invoice through? Um, that's my corporate procurement question. <laughs> Do we need to have 50 documents for a vendor to become certified and blessed in your organization's um, vendor process? Do you really need that? If they've been vetted as a BE or if they've been vetted from the, from the feds? I don't know. It's questions like that that I ask. What are the processes and systems that you have in place that, are, that have become barriers because things have become so complicated? That's the question. It's simply a question. Thank you for asking. So I wanted to talk about the impact of perfectionism. You know, I've seen this a lot. I've actually been involved with this in my own way about burnout, an all or nothing attitude, anxiety and depression. Life has changed for us dramatically. My great grandmother used to say used to is dead and it's never coming back. The impact of professionalism within equity is that it, it cumber, it's becomes cumbersome and it doesn't really allow a growth mindset, self-compassion, self-care, right? That mental well-being that we are all experiencing on, all, on various levels. It diminishes our communication and how our free-flowing thinking may be deterred because we've got to get it right and we've got to get it perfect. Do we really? So what now what? I thought to ask that question. So what now what? I think simply it's about adapting. Notice I keep saying these words, it's about adapting. And so the who is an adaptive mindset. It's adaptive leadership. It's a real model of the original 23 that exists. Adaptive leadership is very much centric uh, as far as customer centric, employee centric, vendor centric, client centric. I will tell you the adaptive leadership model is very close to the platinum rule. Thank you, Dr. Tony Alexandria from his work from 1996, where he said the platinum rule is treat others as they want to be treated. I look at that as to see life through their lens, step in their shoes, live in their space. I will ask the how. I think it's adaptive leading is a way of thinking as far as how we are aware of changing our environments, our awareness of the overall scope to shift the, and being vulnerable to gain team guidance 
as an adaptive leader, I'm point blank saying, I don't have the answers. The V word for our, or for our leaders is so hard. And yet that is where our freedom lies. As an adaptive leader, I'm also yearning for a fresh perspective. I've been looking at the, I've been going around the same wheel for years. Shifting the energy, shifting the mindset, choosing a different way, being vulnerable. So I close that with you. And to be honest, I have a confession. After I present, sit down the presentation that I just shared, a couple of weeks later, this showed up in about three hours. It's a pathway. It's something to consider. It's a roadmap that can be customized going landscape and vertically it's a pledge this is the work that i do my message is basically how do we become adaptive leaders and why is that so important for me it's how we're going to live our new life as this new norm my dad asked me and i'll show you this and then i'll go live again this is where you can find my information. And I asked that question that someone asked in our small group, where do we begin? And I firmly believe that only when your people are empowered to contribute, like really contribute, will your organization thrive beyond the optics of obligation. Real talk, that's where I live in all this. So essentially, I will share with you one last story. My father is an amazing man. He's 86 years old. We have five generations alive in our family. His great, great grandson just turned nine, April 30th. For six days, we had six generations alive. Two weeks after George Floyd's murder, my father called me and he said, Carol, I have a question. I said, okay. He said, Carol, in the new norm, how do we live? How does a pseudo society exist? I said, go on. He said, Carol, when are we gonna stop lying to ourselves? And I said, example, he replied, when are we going to stop in marketing saying all these things we are that we really aren't? You see, my father was a businessman. He broke the color line in 1963 in management. And then I said, continue, because I knew there was more. <clears throat> he then said, you know, I keep getting these letters. I keep seeing these letters from corporations. He's a shareholder. He said, I noticed that two of the letters that I see has the word ethical in it. I said, you know, dad, we haven't seen the word ethics and ethical in a long time in our organizations. I said, dad, I said, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to put equity in all of this. I said, maybe I'll drop the A-L and pick up the S. And that's where ethics and equity come into play was in that conversation with my father. And then my father said, ah, ethics is the center of everything and it negates the pseudo out of all. And then we had a two hour conversation. So that's me and that's what I do. So what questions do you have? Oh, Carol, I'll start off. Um, sure. It, I, I think there's probably some organizations that would look at the slides that you just shared and say, you know, we're trying to transition out of a pandemic and yep. go back into the workplace together. We've got other things we need to focus on right now, but it seems like this would be the perfect time to make major changes with your organization, including incorporating a lot of what you just said. Yeah, it is. And so um, uh, I had a priest that a lot of people would say he was late. 
And I always asserted he was always on time. He was always on time. We're always on time. These conversations don't pop up. They pop when we're ready to hear them. And Chad, I firmly believe that. And where I, my assertion is nothing else can move until, one, until an organization's communication is in check. The, your, the organizations are gonna spin in their same cycle, in the same mess that they've been in for years. And to me, that is the quintessential change of thriving versus surviving. Because if organizations do not choose to figure out a different way and a different mindset, they will not exist between three to five years from now. It's a guarantee. I guarantee it. We can see it. You can feel it. You can smell it. So that's my assertion to that question. And I think that because of all the shifts and all the adapting that had to happen last year, there were many organizations that may said, you've got to have your butt in the chair in the cube are now realizing their employees are probably working three times more than they did a year and a half ago. My question is, do they have to work three times more to prove themselves in remote or hybrid working? Carrie Miller just did a fantastic interview yesterday on this very topic. If you haven't gotten a chance, listen to it. It's really good. And bottom line, bottom line, I kept hearing from the Harvard professor, from the woman who was like the expert, amazing, 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 communication, how you communicate, how do you actively listen? I call it the ACT OF series. It's a theory I came up with. The ACT OF series is how do you actively listen? How do you actively reflect? How do you actively observe? And how do you actively create hope? And I think that's where we are, Chad. We're at an inflection point in a different way because of how important it is for our mental wellness that has shifted dramatically and has impacted all of us. And it will continue to for a while. That's not going away. Thanks, thanks, Carol. Um, sure. If you have other questions, either pipe in or put them in the chat. Um, oh, we have one here. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that with the pandemic, we are all in the same situation. There are arguments against that saying we are all the same storm, but our situations are different. Can you yes. talk about this from an equity perspective? From an equity perspective, if we were in the same space, we wouldn't see all the gaps because all the gaps are continuing to be amplified and exposed. So when I say we're on the same playing field, mentally, we're all in the same spaces of what do we do now? Where do we begin? Well, I'll, I'll try this trick or I'll try that act or let me fix this. Well, here's, you, you don't hear five ways to get through the pandemic, two ways to da 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 That's the optics mess. Sorry, I apologize. But so for me, and yet I don't. And so for me, that's the real conversation. It's all about, it lies in the optics and that's pseudo society. That's what I'm talking about. So the more that we do the pseudo society thing, it'll be interesting to see where we are not in the next five years. But here's the other piece. We as a human collective are moving away from the structures and the systems that no longer work. And we're creating what's new today because we no longer need them. That's the other piece that's happening. We're growing beyond the systems and the structures of the past. That's the other thing that COVID has forced us to look at. So that's what I'm talking about as far as that equity space. Great, Carol. And this is probably, we probably have time for uh, one or two more questions here. Russ Peterson, uh, says, in my profession of architecture, it's primarily about access. Yes. 6% of architects were minorities in 1970, and it's 6% today. Yep. 6% of architects who graduate are women, but only 20% are practicing. Yes. Access to the profession through college, internship, and management style are the primary factors. As for designers, it's a struggle to create designs that thrive for everybody because of the history of Western design and development practices driven through quick profit and historical MBA management styles. Yep. It seems so insurmountable. What's the first step? 
I think the first step is going to the people that you want to bring into the organizations. And that is the internal work of every single leader in the organization has to do their own work. They've got to recognize their implicit bias. They got to recognize where the inequities aren't happening. They've got to ask, we don't know what to do. We need your help. There are people from all walks of life that are utilizing technology in a whole new way. You got to go find them, but you got to do the work yourself first because inauthenticity can be smelled a mile away. If one is not in, if not, if one is not authentic, you will not get the people that you want to come into your into your segment. Period. In. All right. We have one more question here. This is from Dennis Wolf. Perhaps touching on what your dad was asking about: How does corporate America discern between doing what is ethically correct versus wrapping itself around what seems politically correct to gain market share in its industry? Again, it's about being authentic. Every single leader of every organization has, has to look at themselves in the mirror. COVID forced us to look at the stuff we do not want to look at in the mirror. That's what happened February, March through June. We had to look at our stuff. So what did we do? We started cleaning our homes. We still weren't, we, we still weren't looking at ourselves in our own mirror. We started cleaning our homes. What did we do? We sold our homes. What did we do? We went and bought mobile homes but we still weren't looking internally. Those who looked internally said, there's gotta be a different way and have pivoted and adapted. And those are the organizations that are being attractive. It's all the internal work. It's all the individual work. That's where all this begins. And every single leader makes impact in their company culture. I don't care what anyone says. In my mind, that is my truth. And that's where I lie. Every single leader, every single executive leader influences daily again the daily equity practice that is how you make that is the work that needs to happen to make the changes and that's what i get to play in and if people are serious about the real work i would love to connect and yes i am on clubhouse by the way as well as linkedin as well as facebook and twitter and instagram i do hang out on tiktok a little bit all right. Well, thank you so much, Carol. It sounds great. People should know where to find you and uh, we'll be able to give them your contact information as well. That thank concludes you. our morning session. We have our noon one starting very quickly. Why don't we take a, about a two minute break? You can go and grab some water. Maybe we'll make it three. So we'll start again at, uh, let's say 12.03. We'll come back on here and uh, we'll see you all very soon. Thank you, everyone. Please reach out. Would love to connect anytime, anytime. Thank you. Thank you for being in this inquiry with me. It's a great journey. Thank you, Carol.